Okay guys, today we're going to get into some logic a little bit further. Okay. I want to write down this for you. P and Q. Where P and Q are what, what are called statement variables. In other words, they stand for statements. Okay, those are called statement variables. I'm going to give you some more terminology than just what it says in the book. So you need to pay close attention because knowing the terminology deeper will make it easier for you to understand what's going on. Okay, so P is a variable that stands for a statement. P is a statement variable. Q is also a statement variable. Okay, now I'm joining those together with the word and, which is called a conjunction. Well, actually, the whole, the whole sentence is called the conjunction. Sometimes people call the word and a conjunction, and sometimes people call the whole sentence a conjunction. But... The first thing I want to do is introduce you to a phrase called statement form. Okay. So, P and Q are statement variables. I hook those together with the word and. And what I get there is called a statement form. It is technically not a statement in itself. One second, I'm going to fix my microphone here. Okay. So, the words that are coming out of my mouth right now. P and Q. That is technically not a statement. Sometimes people refer to it as a statement, but it's technically a not, not because what, what is a statement? A statement is something that is true or false. P and Q by itself is neither true nor false. It all depends upon what P stands for and what Q stands for. Okay? So, P and Q shows you the form of a statement, but it's not a statement in itself. So it's called a statement form. Now, when I substitute actual statements in place of the variables, then the statement form turns into a statement. Watch what I mean by that. Let me write that down first. When we substitute specific statements for the statement variables, Then the statement form turns into a statement. Okay, for instance. If we substitute
I am cold for P and I am hungry for Q, then P and Q becomes I am cold and I am hungry. Okay, this one is a statement form. It's neither true nor false. P and Q, just by itself. Don't look anything into it. Don't say, but P is I, I am cold and Q is I am hungry. Because it's not yet. I haven't substituted them yet at this point. At this point, it's just one letter of the alphabet and another letter of the alphabet. That has no actual meaning. There's no truth or falsity. Okay? Or another way of saying that is there's no truth value. Okay, but then once I substitute in two specific statements for the two variables, then now I have an actual statement. It is either true or false. Okay, so that's important to understand. The book doesn't really make much of a distinction that I can notice, but I think if you pay attention to that distinction, I think it'll make logic easier for you. Okay, the distinction between a statement form and a statement. And, and many different statements have the same statement form because I can substitute different statements in place for P and Q, okay? I could, for P, I could say, I am warm, and for Q, I could say, I am full. And then, if I substitute those into this statement form, then I would get the statement, I am warm and I am full. So, I am cold and I am hungry, compared to I'm warm and I'm cold, those are two totally different statements, but they have the same statement form, which is P and Q. Okay? All right. So, a statement form has no truth value. It's neither true nor false. But... When we substitute specific statements for the statement variables, then the statement form turns into a statement, which means it turns into something that is either true or false. Okay? So a statement form does not have a truth value, but... A statement form could represent a true statement or a false statement depending upon the truth or falsity of the statements substituted in for the variables. Let me write that down. A statement form can represent... A 
I was going to say both, um, and I wonder if it's maybe better to say either or. Either a true statement. I'm not saying the statement form is a true statement. I'm saying represent either a true statement or a false statement. depending upon the truth or falsity of the specific statements substituted in for the statement variables. That's very important. <clears throat> okay. You need to internalize that. <clears throat> you might not like that I give these wordy explanations, but they're important. Don't gloss them over. Okay, I'm trying to teach this to you so that you understand from the, from the beginning up, from the bottom up, okay? The... The more into it you understand, the easier it'll all seem. There are going to be some things that are going to be confusing. And they will be less confusing if you understand things from the bottom up. So I am I am not going to just give you the top layer. Because then there are going to be things that are going to confuse you. Okay? Don't just gloss over these explanations that I'm giving because then you're not going to be well set up. Okay, so let me give you another set of examples, okay? Mm, so I'll tell you a couple of facts. Okay, so I happen to be about 5 feet 10 inches tall. Tiny bit taller, but let's say 5'10". Okay, and I also happen to have brown hair. Although that is starting to change, but let's try to ignore that. So those are two facts. Okay, now I'm going to write a statement form. P and Q. All right. Now, let's do some substituting in. So let's say in place of P, let's write I am 510. And in place of Q, let's write, I have brown hair. Then the statement form P and Q turns into the statement, I am 510 and I have brown hair. Okay, now let's do another substitution. In 
place of p, let's um, let's do the same one. I am five ten. But in place of q, let's substitute in the statement. I have brown hair. I mean, sorry, I'm going to say blonde hair. Then the statement form p and q would become. I am 510 and I have blonde hair. Okay, two different statements. In fact, one's true and one's false. So they're very different from each other but they both have the same form. And the form is one big statement made out of a small statement and a small statement. Okay, same form. And that form is called a conjunction. Okay, now let's look at this first one over here on the left, that is true. I am 5'10 and I have brown hair is true. And it just so happens <coughs> that the two individual statements substituted in for P and Q are also true. And together they gave me a true conjunction. Now, by substituting in a different pair of statements, I am 5'10", which is true. I have blonde hair, which is false. Substituting those in gives me a conjunction. I am 5'10", and I have blonde hair, which happens to be false. Okay. So you see the form P and Q can represent a true statement or a false statement. And whether it represents a true statement or a false statement depends upon the truth values of the statements that are being substituted in for the variables. Okay, that's everything that I had said earlier. I have just summarized it for you in this example. And P and Q itself, without any statements substituted in for the variables, just letter P, word and, letter Q, that itself is neither true nor false. It has no truth value. And so because it, by itself, it has no truth value, then we should really not be calling it a statement because statements are things that have truth values. Truth value meaning truth or falsity. Okay? So th this up here is a statement form. It shows you the logical form of a statement but it is not an actual statement because by itself, it's neither true nor false. When I substitute statements in for the variables, then the statement form turns into a statement because it then picks up a truth value. And whether or not, whether the truth value is true or false depends upon the truth values of the two statements that were substituted in for P and Q. Okay, that's everything in a nutshell. So, what I want to teach you right now is, how does the truth values of the statements substituted in affect 
the truth value of the statement that you get. Okay, so over there we saw that substituting two true statements in for P and Q gives us a conjunction that's true. Over here we saw, just a second, Over here, we saw that substituting in a true statement for P and a false statement for Q gives us a conjunction that's false. So you see, <clears throat> whether the conjunction is true or false depends entirely upon the truth or falsity of the statements substituted in for P and Q. And I want to teach you that relationship right now. And we do that using something that's called a truth table. I'm going to draw a table. Hold on, I didn't mean for that to come out red. Let's, let's do black. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna separate here. Over here, I'm just gonna write the two variables, p and q. A column for each one. And I want to write down all is going to be in this case four possibilities of the combinations of true or false for p and q so one possible combination is p is true and q is true another possible combination is p is true and q is false and another possible combination is P is false and Q is true. And the only remaining possibility is P and Q are both false. Okay? It should be easy for you to figure out the four possible combinations. If there's three variables, there will be eight possible combinations. Okay? If there are N variables, then there will be two to the power n possible combinations. And I'm going to leave that to you each time to write down all of the different possible combinations. That should not be a difficult task. In fact, after you've done it several times, you can almost just do it without thinking, okay? All right, now I'm going to make a column for the conjunction p and q. Oh, and by the way, this is the symbol for and. That's the symbol for AND. It is not an intersection symbol. It is not curved. It is pointed. Okay, that stands for the word AND. All right, so I'm going to tell you now the relationship between the truth values of P and Q in relation to the truth value of P and Q, okay? So, if P and Q are both true, then the conjunction P and Q is true. And that's the only situation in which the conjunction is true. If one or both of the statements substituted in for P or Q are false, then the conjunction will be false. And we call this thing the truth table for a conjunction. And you need to have that memorized. I mean, not like a mental picture of the truth table, although you certainly can try to memorize that. But what I mean most of all is, you need to memorize those relationships. A conjunction is true if both of the components are true. And it is false otherwise. Okay? 
So that's why the one right above that I highlighted in yellow, I'm 5'10 and I have brown hair, that's a true statement because I'm 5'10 is true and I have brown hair is also true. But I'm 5'10 and I have blonde hair is false because one of those two components, I have blonde hair, is false. And that makes the conjunction false. Even though I'm 5'10, that part is true. But once I conjoin that with a false statement, then I get overall a false statement. Okay? All right, now, that's the word and. Now we're going to do the word or, which is called a disjunction. Let me see where we are here. Okay. So now we're going to do the word or, which is a disjunction. P or Q. The symbol for or is just an inverted conjunction symbol that gives us the disjunction symbol. Okay? So you would see it written like this in logic. Okay? Same idea. That's a statement form, not a statement. It can represent a true statement or a false statement, depending upon the truth or falsity of the statements substituted in for the statement variables. And let me show you the truth table for that, so that you understand the relationship for disjunctions. Okay, so once again, we'll do a column for P, a column for Q. I like to separate those with a bar here, and then we'll do the disjunction of P and Q, which means P or Q. Okay, four possible combinations are true, 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 false, False true, false false. And here's how disjunctions work. If either one of the components are true, then the disjunction is true. So if P represents a true statement and Q represents a true statement, then P or Q would represent a true statement. If P represents a true statement and Q represents a false statement, then P or Q would represent a true statement. If P represents a false statement and Q represents a true statement, then P or Q represents a true statement. And if P and Q both represent false statements, then P or Q represents a false statement. So in other words, the only time a disjunction is false is if both components are false. Otherwise, the disjunction is true. Now, that is the logical way that it works. That is not always the way that it works when people are speaking to each other in a conversation because, like, here's an example. If I said to you, you will give me a soda or I will punch you in the arm, okay? And then what if you gave me a soda and I still punched you in the arm. I better write this down, okay? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to use the word if. I want to stay away from the word if. So, you give me, let's say, your soda, or I punch you. 
okay? And let's just say for the sake of argument that you do give me your soda. So this turns out to be true. Now I know that you would expect to not get punched in that case, but what if I punch you anyways? What if that turns out to be true? Then the question I have to you is, does that mean that I lied to you when I said that? Now, in our English language, the way we use the word or, you would probably say, yeah, you lied to me. But that's because we misuse the word or in the English language. Okay? The truth is this. Just picture yourself. Picture me saying that to you. You give me your soda or I punch you. Picture yourself giving me the soda. And then picture me punching you. And then you would say, hey, that's not fair. Why did you punch me? Now, this doesn't sound very polite, but I'm just, I'm not talking about manners here. I'm talking about logic. I could totally say to you, yeah, well, I never, I never told you that I would not punch you if you did give me the soda. I just told you that I would punch you if I didn't. Uh, I'm sorry, that if I would punch you if you didn't give me the soda. See what I'm saying? Let me repeat that because I stumbled a little bit. So let's, let's say that again. I say to you, you give me your soda or I punch you. So you don't want to get hit. So you give me the, your soda and then I punch you anyways. And you say, hey, that's not fair. You said that if, if I gave you my soda, you wouldn't punch me. And then I could come back to you and say, no, I didn't. I said, if you didn't give me the soda, I would punch you. But I never said that I wouldn't punch you if you did give me the soda. Do you see what I'm saying? Again, that would not be polite, but we're not talking about manners here. We're talking about logic. Okay? So, a lot of times people refer to this as the inclusive or. Meaning, in logic, when you say the word or, it means one or the other or both. Okay? See, look. When you use the word or, that means one thing is true, or the other is true, or they're both true. Those are the times when an or statement is true. And so a lot of people call that the inclusive or. One or the other or both. I don't like... Oh, and by the way, that brings up this phrase. There is something called exclusive or. Which is one or the other. But not both. Okay? In logic, the word or always means this. In the English language, when we say the word or, we usually mean this. But in logic, the word or always means inclusive or. Okay? Now, personally, I don't like those phrases, inclusive or, exclusive or, because it makes it sound like there's two correct uses of the word or. Um, I don't like to say inclusive or exclusive or. What I like to say is the correct use of the word or and an incorrect use of the word or. The, the bottom line is that the inclusive or is the correct use of the word or. Okay? A lot of people use the word or exclusively. I understand that. And I do it myself every single day of my life. But when we do that, we're using the word or incorrectly. 
okay? But we do that a lot. I mean, how many times have you said you're dying of thirst and you weren't really dying, were you? Okay, that's the thing. In, in any language, we use words incorrectly, okay? The word organic is a perfect example. You go to the store and you say, oh, where's the organic produce? Well, if you're using that word correctly, the answer is all the produce is organic because the word organic means carbon-based. If you've taken organic chemistry, you know that. Okay? There's not a vegetable on this planet that is not carbon-based. So every vegetable on the planet is organic if we were using the word organic correctly. But in the English language, we have this other meaning of the word organic, which is technically incorrect, but we've become so used to it that we consider it correct. You see what I'm saying? So that's what is the difference between inclusive or or exclusive or. And I don't think that you should worry about, oh, which one is being used here so much. I think what you should ask yourself is, is the word or being used correctly or not? The correct use of the word or is inclusive, one or the other or both. If you wanted to speak exclusively and you also wanted to speak logically correct, then you would say one or the other, but not both. Okay, and a couple of other ways of doing that is say either one or the other, or to say exactly one of the two. And it talks about that in the book. The most important thing is for you to know that when you see a disjunction, if it just says P or Q, then that means one or the other or both. And that statement, P or Q, is true as long as at least one of the components is true, and it is false if both components are false. Okay, now the third and last thing for today is called a negation. So we did conjunction, which is and. We did disjunction, which is or, and now we're going to do negation, which we will use this symbol, but some people like to use that symbol. Either one is fine, I guess, but I'm going to use the top one because that's what the book uses. And that represents not. Okay. So this one's, this one's easier than conjunction and disjunction because this only involves one variable. If I write that, then that means, well, technically it means the negation of P. But a, a simpler way to think about it, which is, which is absolutely the same, is not P. So, so that is a statement form also. This is right here. That's a statement form, not a statement, because it's just a symbol followed by a letter or or if you look here, okay, that's a statement form, not a statement, because it says not the letter P. There's no such thing as true or false if I say not the letter P, okay? But if I substitute a statement in for P, the statement that I substitute in for P will be either true or false. And then in that case, not P will then represent a true or false statement. Okay? So, 
if we substitute I am 510 for P, whoops, then not p becomes i am not 510 okay and in that case this statement form which is neither true nor false because it's just a form of a statement it's not a statement itself if I substitute a statement in for P, then it becomes this, which is a statement. Okay, which is true or false. Even if you don't know if it's true or false, maybe you've never measured me or whatever, so you don't know if it's true or false, but even though you don't know which one it is, you still know that it's one of the, one of the two. I either am 510 or I'm not. Okay, all right, let's do a truth table for negation. Now there's only one variable, so there's only going to be two rows. It's a very small truth table. Let's put P, and then we'll be able to figure out its negation. So P is either true or false. If P is true, then the negation's false, and if P is false, then the negation's true. Very simple. Okay? Now, the only thing I have to say about negations, in addition to this, is just be careful. There's a lot of things that where there's a gray area in life, so you have to be a little bit careful. So here's what I want to point out, okay? If P is the statement, I am cold, and if I asked you what's the negation of that, it's tempting to say the negation of I am cold is I am hot. And that would be false because Just because you aren't cold doesn't mean you're hot. You might be warm, right? There's a third category, a gray area in between. So if, if P is representing the statement, I am cold, then the negation of P would be, I am not cold. It would not be, I am hot. It would be, I am not cold, okay? And you need to remember that. When you negate something, what you're doing is you are literally putting the word not onto it. Okay? Now, maybe there is another word that means not the first, and that would be okay. Like a light switch. Not one with a dimmer, just an on-off switch. If P represents the statement, the light is on then the negation of that would be the light is not on. And in that case, you could say what? You could say the light is off. Because for lights, there's either on or off. So not on means the same thing as off. But for temperature, it's not true to say you're either hot or cold. So if you want to negate I am cold, you would say, I am not cold. Okay, that's just a little word of warning for those. Okay, have a good afternoon.